Bonjour, uh, uh, bonjour, bienvenue. Hello, Suzanne. Um, welcome to all of you who are here today in the auditorium of the Musée d'Art Moderne Grand Duc Jean, Moudam Luxembourg, and also uh, welcome to everyone who is joining us uh, via Zoom, uh, wherever you are in the world. It's great to have you with us here today for this event. My name is Suzanne Cotter. I'm the director of, of uh, MUDAM. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with my colleague and curator of this program, Joël Vallabraga. I'd just like to share with you a few opening remarks before we pass on uh, to introductions and then to uh, our uh, lecture today with Suzanne. The museum as a platform for artistic and cultural exchange is central to the mission of the Musée d'Art Moderne Grand Duc Jean. As a collecting institution and in its presentation of the art of our time, in this current moment of global pandemic and urgent redress of social inequalities and injustices, at MUDAM, we are conscious of the fact that the museum cannot dissociate itself from the challenges faced by individuals, communities, and society globally. It is our privilege uh, as people who work in the museum and who lead museums to be able to act on this recognition of the importance of the engagement of our museum with these issues of today, and also to be able to think through how we might address them through our own programs. And it's this thinking, in fact, that has guided the development of uh, the lectures and screenings, uh, which will be presented here at MUDAM uh, throughout this year, 2021, under the title of Radio Disaster. Uh, the program is inaugurated today um, with a lecture by climate justice, justice creative, campaigner and strategic researcher of environmental justice and decolonization, Suzanne Daliwal. And we are absolutely thrilled to have her with us uh, today, um, here visible on screen. Joelle will say uh, a little more in a moment to introduce Suzanne. Um, I would also like to acknowledge uh, Joelle Vallabraga for her uh, curating of this program, um, as well as Caroline Hoffman of our public outreach team here and public programs at the museum, and our communication and engagement team, and our uh, technical team, uh, and led for this series of events uh, heroically by Taufik Matim. In 2015, the member countries of the United, States, United Nations announced their plan for a sustainable world under the title Transforming Our World. This was underpinned by themes of people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership, and driven by a vision for, I quote, a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity, the rule of law, justice, equality, and non-discrimination of respect for race, ethnicity, and cultural diversity, and of equal opportunity, permitting the full realization of human potential and contributing to shared prosperity. In aiming to achieve this vision, 17 goals for sustainable, sustainable development leading up to the year 2030 were identified. Addressing climate change as one of these goals uh, the statement uh, or the text of transforming our world states, climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our time and its adverse impacts undermine the ability of all countries to achieve sustainable development. Increases in global temperature, sea level rise, ocean acidification and other climate change impacts are seriously affecting coastal areas and low-lying coastal countries, including many least developed countries and small island developing states. The survival of many societies and of the biological support systems of the planet is at risk. And it goes on. A new approach is needed. Sustainable development recognizes that eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions 
combating inequality within and among countries, preserving the planet, creating sustained, inclusive and sustainable economic growth and fostering social inclusion are linked to each other and are independent. Also in 2015, so in the same year, in responding to uh, the Transforming Our World, UNESCO produced a recommendation for the protection and promotion of museums, their diversity and their role in society, and highlighting the connections between museums and sustainable development. I quote from their document, museums, uh, that museums are as spaces for cultural transmission, intercultural dialogue, learning, discussion and training also play an important role in education, formal, informal and lifelong learning, social cohesion and sustainable development. Museums have great potential to raise public awareness of the value of cultural and natural heritage and of the responsibility of all citizens to contribute to their care and transmission. Um, I want to end there, but I think I wanted to really frame uh, uh, why we here at MUDAM have inaugurated this program, why it is important to us and how we see the museum as an active agent within this world that we're all living in um, and that serves people. We want to be able to be a place where people who come to the museum also recognize themselves, but we also want to be a place that uh, strives to embody the values that uh, look to achieve equality, peace and prosperity for everybody in the world. Um, on that note, I'm going to pass over to Joelle. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon to everyone, those physically present and those attending via live stream. Um, again, my name is Joelle Vallebrega, I'm curator of performances and public programs here at MUDAM. And today with Susan Cotter and Susan Daliwa, we are very excited to be launching this year-long program entitled Radio Disaster, the Climate Series Program. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to have this opportunity to have Suzanne here with us. I've been following her work for quite some time. Um, Suzanne is a climate justice creative, a researcher, lecturer in environmental justice, and a trainer in creative strategies for decolonization. She was voted as one of London's most influential people in environment 2018 by the Evening Standard. And in 2009, she co-founded the UK Tar Sands Network, which challenged the BP and the Shell investments in the Canadian Tar Sands in solidarity with indigenous communities, encouraging the internationalism of the fossil fuel divestment movement. Suzanne had led many campaigns and artistic interventions to challenge fossil fuels investments in the Arctic and in Nigeria that violated the rights of indigenous communities and of those seeking justice in the wake of the BP Gulf, disaster, uh, Gulf of Mexico disaster. She has a Master of Arts in Social Sculpture in Oxford, where she developed creative strategies to address the lack of representation and ongoing white supremacy in the climate justice movement. Today, we will listen to her as she shares her knowledge and wisdom in using creative skills in supporting environmental justice and indigenous rights. Suzanne will explore the relationship between, um, uh, between white supremacy, colonialism, and ecological degradation. Working via international and intergenerational solidarity, her work has sought to uplift those challenging the patterns which have led to the devastation of what we know of the Anthropocene. Um, following the talk, there will be a dedicated moment for questions. So for those attending um, in the auditorium, please keep them for later. And for those attending via live stream, you can use the chat form and your questions will be asked. With no further delay, I pass the word to Suzanne. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Very good. Great. So yeah, thank you to the, everybody at the museum and for everyone who supported us to come together at this unprecedented time to have this conversation. Um, been very much inspired by rereading some of the works of Walter Benjamin and today is kind of um, a cross between a scrapbook um, and also a radio transmission as I'm coming to you today um, across the internet. So I really wanted to, um, yeah, thank you again for taking this time, um, as was mentioned in the beginning, in the introduction remarks, 
the gallery and the museum plays a pivotal role in convening space for us to reflect on not only um, this moment in history and how we got here, but to reflect on the cultures of activism themselves so that we can develop the forms that we need um, as we move forward into this time of ingoing um, climate catastrophes, global pandemics and humanitarian disasters. Um, so I just wanted to start off a little bit by um, bringing you into this image here. It very much reflects um, where my work has been, um, you know, working both as a climate activist on the ground, mainly at the intersection of extraction and indigenous rights. Um, that means that so much of my work has been in response um, in relationship to the fossil fuels and sites of extraction that are taking place globally. And I think that's really important for when we're framing the climate crisis, that we think about the, the devastation and the destruction that is happening on the land already. We often think about the climate crisis as being this future phenomena, this blade drama, Blade Runner-esque um, catastrophic thing arriving in the future. However, we know that this crisis has been the result of generations of extraction of violence to the land and to the territories where fossil fuels are found. So being open and being listening to those communities has been the grounding of my work. So this is actually a work called Echo um, and it's a megaphone which I took the internal engineering of it and rewired it so that it actually became a listening device. Um, and so it became a, an instrument, a way to really physically manifest and display a lot of the principles that were going into my work that before we get on the megaphone, before we take action, before we develop our campaigns and put out asks into the world, we take this moment to listen and to understand and to digest the ways in which the climate crisis is already impacting communities on the ground, how it's interconnected with the um, generations of colonial violence, of displacement of community from their territories. And also, as well as that devastation, the range of strategies, of movements, of ways of resisting colonialism that have been taking place in there so that when we come forward with solutions and strategies, they are intergenerational, they are bringing forward that wisdom and that we're humble in that space. And I often say, you know, that we cannot solve the climate crisis with the mentality that created it. So as well as challenging external racism, external white supremacy and colonialism, that's also very much a personal process of taking that time to actively listen, to um, be changed as well by what we're hearing. So as I mentioned, um, just, as I mentioned, um, again, in terms of this framing of the climate crisis, it's often um, talked about in terms of parts per million as um, changes to global systems. However, one thing that's really crucial and vital to the way that I entered into this work, which as I mentioned, was working with communities on the front line of extraction, is that a lot of the destruction that we often fear has already taken place on the territories of indigenous black and brown communities. So for me, when I was studying um, in 2007, the global scale of the climate crisis and starting to understand that we had reached peak oil, and that we were entering into an age of heavy oil. So that includes tar sands, fracking, um, other forms of extraction. Um, these fuels require three to five times more water to extract, they're three to five times more polluting. And as you can see from the image here, this is the Canadian tar sands. Um, we often hear about the Amazon um, de being deforested and the destruction that is taking place 
Um, but we don't often hear as much about the destruction that is happening up in the boreal forest. Um, the boreal and the Amazon are often thought of as the two lungs of the planet. So for me, when I was um, looking at the climate crisis and looking at these tipping points and these um, tipping spots that they're often referred to as, so as well as the Amazon, the boreal forest was one of those. And what was happening up there in Canada was that the Canadian government was overwriting the rights of indigenous people to protect their territories and their land in order to extract tar sands fossil fuel. So as I mentioned, tar sands fossil fuel, it's a heavy oil. Um, and in order to extract it, it's not just a, a, um, a drilling process. You literally have to remove the ecosystem. So on the top, you can see that's, you know, an entire ecosystem, not only is it, um, one of the most important carbon sinks on the planet. It's also home to numerous indigenous communities who practice the right to hunt and trap and fish. Um, their, you know, their whole range of food sovereignty um, takes place on there. And what the industry calls this is overburden. So in order to um, access the oil, they remove what they call overburden, what we would call life in order to extract the tar sands. So the scale of the tar sands destruction, if it goes ahead, is the size of England and Wales. Um, most of the global um, corporations, oil corporations, energy corporations have been operating in the tar sands. There's huge amounts of investment that have been happening here. And as I said, this isn't some future scenario. This extraction has been happening for about 55 years already. And you can see here that this is what it looks like once it's been, um, the land has been devastated. So, you know, I've, I've been here and I've walked through this territory and when you're walking, a cannon goes off every three to five seconds. That's how they keep the animals from landing there. Huge amounts of animals and birds have died. Um, you can fly over this for quite some time and, and still not reach the end of it. It's an entire reconfiguration of this ecosystem, what has been coined um, as ecocide by the late lawyer Polly Higgins. Um, and that's a really important term for us to also bring into this conversation around climate change when we're thinking about the fact that this devastation is already taking place. So ecocide refers to the devastation of a territory or ecosystem where it can no longer be rehabilitated and also the traditional practices, the traditional ways of living on there cannot be exercised. So that um, law, ecocide is currently um, trying to be brought under the Rome Statute of Peace. Um, and the tar sands operators were tried for ecocide within a London Supreme Court mock trial. So again, this idea of this, this future scenario, this future um, apocalypse is already there given, you know, depending on which communities that you speak to. So I just wanted to bring that term into the room to also think about that, you know, as well as the strategies for keeping the fossil fuels in the ground, for protecting these ecosystems, it's the way that we see the landscape um, that also needs to be transformed. And that is part of the philosophical and cultural work that we must do to uh, avert the climate crisis. So um, as I mentioned, this was back in about 2007 when I started to make the correlation between extraction, heavy fossil fuels, um, reaching peak oil, and the importance and centrality of indigenous rights within that struggle. Um, if we look globally, 80% of the biodiversity that needs to be protected um, is actually either under the um, in, um, rule of indigenous people, that could be ceded territory, unceded territory, um, and lands where the community still have the rights to that territory. However, governments such as the Canadian government, which are seen often as you know, liberal friendly governments, continually are um, overriding those communities' rights. And what comes with that is also an epidemic of sexual violence um, and missing murdered indigenous women. So with that extraction comes with it, temporary foreign workers, um, man camps. And you know, a lot of the time I've, I've been through some of those communities 
um, there's high rates of substance abuse with the workers as they themselves are traumatized by the destruction that is happening there. So it's not even like these economies um, that are coming from fossil fuels are leading to great jobs or you know, careers that are what we envision for our future. So it's a totally rethinking as well of the kinds of jobs and the kinds of um, risks that come with this kind of industry as well, as well as the um, carbon emissions, as I mentioned, you know, the high polluting carbon emissions of tar sands oil. Um, the plans for tar sands oil is to ship it um, from Canada through the pipelines along the West Coast to Russia and to China. So that's completely, you know, upside down energy calculus when we're thinking about shifting to renewables, to shifting to localizer energy systems. And this image here is um, from a walk that we took through the um, Canadian tar sands. And that's a really, what I wanted to bring up here is around the fact that, you know, there's been a real sort of resurgence or surgence even of climate activism recently, but it's really important for us to understand that we're walking into legacies of environmental resistance, of communities that have been calling attention to this destruction for generations. Um, and that often what we think is needed, what are the strategies aren't always, um, you know, getting from A to Z. Sometimes there are calls for working with ceremony, um, with witnessing, with bearing witness to what is happening there. So in this instance, as well as running campaigns, we were called to witness the devastation. Um, and personally for me, even though I was working on financial campaigns, political campaigns, when you witness that scale of destruction with the communities, you are forever changed. Your whole internal psyche, your own ability to think about who are we if that is the kind of economy and landscape that we are creating. And I think that's really something important for us to think about as well, being changed ourselves by what is happening and not just on a cognitive level, but on an emotional and spiritual and physiological level as well. So um, back in 2009, um, I attempted to put the tar sands issue onto the agenda of a lot of major um, nonprofit organizations. So that's, you know, Greenpeace, a lot of the um, organizations that were doing some of that work. And what was very really difficult was to make the connection between indigenous rights, fossil fuels, keeping them in the ground, protecting biodiversity and indigenous rights. Um, and if any of you know or work in the sector, the environmental sector is actually the second least diverse um, industry. So as a young woman of color, um, for me, I immediately had to move into a space of um, entrepreneurship, of innovation, of creativity, because I couldn't get the organization that I was working at at that time to take this seriously. So I started a, a really grassroots organization called UK Tar Sands Network, and we worked to begin to internationalize and amplify what was happening on the front line. Um, and that was, you know, not just again the um, the difficulties, the the terror that the communities were under, but also the analysis of the situation, the analysis of how tar sands extraction was the continuation of colonialism, how that sat with their rights to their sovereignty and also the complicity of the British crown. So all of those elements being part of the campaign um, and it also came down to um, the design. So with the logo, we had this logo which was, you know, a, a bloody flag. It was at first a, a black oil drip in the middle. Um, however, the chief of the um, community and the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation asked for that to be a red drop because he said that it's our blood oil. It's our blood that is the cost of this oil. So, you know, from the beginning of our organization, all of our design decisions, all of the framing decisions were led by and determined by the community. And I think that's a really important point to note because, you know, when we did these actions, this is the um, Canadian High, um, High Commission in London. When we did these actions in London, it wasn't necessarily us who were having the implications of them or the ramifications of them. Um, when Canadian um, Indigenous people speak up, 
for them, there can be these implications of having um, contracts removed from them, increased violence, increased white supremacy um, in their homes, because as I mentioned, there is this ongoing racism towards indigenous communities that they're facing while they try and resist and protect their homelands. So that's something really important to, for us to think about of those principles of collaboration, um, of taking direction from the front lines and always being responsive to them. And I think that came up in the, in the opening comments as well about being in service to those communities. Um, and so, what happened from that campaign was that as well as connecting the dots between the Canadian government and the British government and the Crown and how that relates with the treaties that the Britain signed with Canada, we also started to think about other ways in which Britain was complicit in the extraction of tar sands and other fossil fuels that Indigenous communities are trying to keep in the ground. Um, and so this was the beginning of the um, divestment movement. And what we tried to do was to expose the pipeline of money that was not only fueling these projects, but a lot of these um, investments had not been checked for if the projects actually had permission to go ahead. So under the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, um, that is called the right to free prior and informed consent. So under that jurisdiction, um, any projects that go ahead that get investment should have that consultation done before they go ahead. However, none of those projects in the tar sands have gone through proper assessment. There's no cumulative impact assessment. Extractive industries continue to run free reign. You know, it's still that Wild West kind of mentality. And so we started doing um, these kind of stunts at the annual shareholder meetings of the banks to expose not only, again, their complicity in the climate struggle, but the human rights abuses, um, the way that these banks were on one hand, you know, claiming to be leaders within the climate movement, however, investing in projects like these. And it was also to expose the tar sands and the real risks associated with it as the Canadian government was trying to um, convey that this oil was cleaner than Saudi oil because Canadians um, respect um, gay rights, all sorts of PR that was happening with that oil. So that um, campaign continued for, you know, well over a decade, and that has now internationalized into what is the divestment movement. And I think the divestment movement um, is interesting and needs to continue, but it's really important that it's connected to also asserting the rights of Indigenous peoples, as well as the climate impacts of those projects. And the image below is, um, you know, we also, as well as trying to stop future projects, as we develop these relationships with the communities, we were also responding to catastrophes that were happening. Um, and so the picture at the bottom, that is the BP AGM, just a few uh, af months after the BP Deepwater Horizon spill. Um, and again, what we did was we um, met with the community, tried to understand how they were picturing the crisis um, and creating these stunts outside. But what was important was that we were also going into the meetings to convey the asks and the wants of the community. So in this case, they were asking for um, compensation for fisher people, um, as well as trying to look at the health impacts of Corexit, which was being used to clean up the um, spill. So that's another part of it as well, that it's beyond just illustrating the catastrophe. There's also a functional relationship where you are working with the community to use your access to power, your access to these shareholder meetings, to push for the policies, um, for the needs of the communities on the front lines, as well as this wider rubric of um, pushing to stop projects that are violating the environment and the climate. And I think that's one of the key um, principles of climate justice and that's why it comes back to this image at the beginning of of listening of, of doing consultation of deep consultation and sometimes that takes longer it can make the project longer it can have you on working across time zones but essentially it's building that deeper infrastructure um, to do the work and moving beyond illustration as well um, and so as well as exposing the 
pipeline um, between money and these projects. We also took a look at cultural institutions. So within the UK, um, the a lot of the major galleries um, and museums are sponsored by BP and Shell. And what that essentially does is it supports those companies to have a social license to operate. So what we tried to do was to first of all even bring to the public attention the fact that there are these relationships between these companies and the galleries um, and then to use it as an arena to again you know bring attention to the catastrophes that are happening but also to bring into question um, the the cultural um, complicity of the galleries as well and I think that you know, there's two, two moments of that um, campaign. And I think we have illustrated those relationships. And I think we're in an exciting moment where galleries and museums are acknowledging their complicity. And we're trying to think about how we can um, work together to move through that. So this is an image from um, an action that um, happened at the BP summer party just a little bit after the Deepwater Horizon. Um, and as I mentioned, a lot of my work is as an archivist as well. And I try and bring out these pictures and these moments of movement, her story as well, because often um, as women of color, we have to write ourselves back into that story. So I just wanted to share some of those moments there from for you there. Um, and continuing with that, um, you know, as well as the other sort of head to this um, beast, <laughs> so to speak, we have the corporations, the oil companies, the banks. In addition to that, we had to also look at the um, role of the EU government and the EU parliament, sorry. Um, and what we found was that actually within the EU, there was a lot of initiative to keep this tar sands oil from flowing to Europe. The EU was starting to understand, you know, the high impact of this fuel. Um, however, what happened was that the UK government and the Canadian government started to collude together to try and under, undermine um, the EU directive. And this happens a lot where we see um, oil companies, um, their lobby interests trying to undermine the good work, the um, legislation and the initiatives within the Europe to try and take action on limiting fossil fuels from initiatives. So, you know, however, this is quite a complex, convoluted process. If any of you have ever been involved in um, the EU Parliament or the EU Commission, it's very esoteric. This campaign went for about six years. Um, and so what we tried to do was to work with other ways of trying to expose this um, and also to help with our fatigue. You know, if you're constantly doing the same protest in the rain, it just gets exhausting. So what I tried to do here was I worked with um, a felt artist, Lucy Sparrow, and we created this scene, which was the felt impacts where she works with felt and we try to make um, a scene which showed, you know, the, the cancers and the tumors that a lot of these animals in the tar sands um, get from the accumulative pollution in the water. And so we set up this scene outside of the um, Canadian um, Canada House in London again. And there was a few reasons for that. One was to expose the lobbying initiative. It was also a way for us to bring other people along who couldn't necessarily do direct action. So they could be involved in the sewing, in the, in the making of these pieces. And that's one of the ways that we try to think about, you know, how do we access and create entry points for other people to be involved in this work who might not be able to take direct action either because of their legal status, um, their physicality, um, you know, within England as well, the racism that we experience from the police. So we're constantly thinking about, um, you know, creating those new ways of people being involved and also reaching new audiences. So, you know, for this, it was reaching a pop art audience as well. So through that collaboration, um, creating new forms, creating new ways of bringing people to understand processes um, that can be a little bit um, esoteric and, and boring as well. So that's just a way that we've been able to keep these issues in the press and sustain that. Um, 
And building on that, you know, that also means um, trying to use humor and trying to use fashion and trying to use um, other ways of also reaching those in power. So this was a hat collection that we actually commissioned for Kate Middleton when she was um, going to Alberta, Canada at the time of, of wildfires there. However, she didn't visit the tar sands. So we commissioned these hats. Um, there was a series of 10 and um, they also went in Grazia with banner ads there. So the idea was to, you know, again, bring the reality of what is happening to the tar sands to people, reach a new audience and come to where people are as well. They're already in the fashion magazines, in women's magazines. So how can we have that conversation there? And how can we also work a little bit with the strange, you know, not necessarily always spelling it completely out, bringing people into the conversation, um, finding other ways to make that engaging and interesting. And again, all the time, also always doing that, not only for the audience, but also for ourselves um, to, to avoid that burnout, to avoid doing the same thing again, to find new ways to enter into the same topic and situation. So, you know, as I mentioned, um, as we framed this at the beginning, so much of this work is coming from uh, and legacies, legacies of environmental justice that as people of color, we have inherited. Um, and so one of the environmental justice ancestors that I work with, and, and when we say environmental justice, um, just to frame that in terms of climate justice, environmental justice is intimately tied to the rights of the communities who are indigenous to that territory. So there is no separation between the fight for indigenous rights and environmental justice. They're intimately connected. It's also intimately connected for those people who are on the front lines of extraction. And that can also include refineries um, and tailing ponds where oil is extracted as well. And so for me, I take a lot of inspiration um, from Ken Sarawiwa. And Ken Sarawiwa um, was a member of the Ogoni people and led his people in Nigeria to resist Shell from the occupation of his lands. Um, sadly, that resulted in the, his execution along with the Agoni Nine. And I think that speaks to the power that communities have in resistance to these projects. And the thing that was so important about Ken's work was that Ken moved between being an activist, a playwright, a dramatist, and a comedian. Um, he had a radio show and a TV show, um, which communicated to the communities about their rights, about the ways of resistance. And that is why he had so much power in that movement. And I think that's really important when we think about the role of cultural production within movements. Um, it's not just to, illustrate the situations, but is the key way that we um, give life force to our movements, how we keep them interconnected and how we connect them through the, um, the generations as well. So um, a few years ago it was the 20, 20th year anniversary um, since the execution of Ken and the Agoni Nine. And so I was really humbled to work with the communities in Nigeria and with the British um, Nigerian artist Sakari Douglas Camp. And we made this, she made this sculpture which had the names of those who had been killed, um, as well as I accused the oil companies of genocide written along the side. And what was really interesting about the sculpture was this had um, moved across the UK for many years doing education work about Shell's role in Nigeria. And for the 20th year anniversary, the community in Nigeria asked for the bus to come home. Um, and so we thought about how we could get the bus back to Nigeria. Um, in the back of it, there's also a theatre, there was a library. It was really um, a, a chance to do that community education work. Um, so we actually tried to send it back to Nigeria. Um, sadly, it was... Um, 
held up um, the colonel who was actually responsible for the execution of the Agoni Nine, um, took the bus away. We never saw it again, but we used that as a way to use this, um, the absence of the bus as a way to still get a story, to try and, you know, raise awareness within a new generation about Cancer Era and the Agoni Nine. And um, we worked with um, late, designer um, John Daniel who produced these images for us and we got these on um, again radio the hip-hop radio station started sharing these on Twitter and it became this movement for this bus so it was a really powerful moment how this bus this this sculpture this gesture of solidarity um, and this kind of um, almost bizarre gesture to get it across the sea and to take it home, captured the imagination of people and was able to transmit that story of, of the Agoni Nine. So, um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, a lot of this ancestry, a lot of this history of the environmental movement has been erased in the last few years with the um, onset of groups like XR and you know, the incredible work of Greta, but at the same time, it's really erased a lot of the communities who have been doing a lot of the work. We often call it the struggle within the struggle, um, the struggle to keep our visibility. And it's not, again, it's not just the, um, the devastation that we face, but also the strategies and solutions that we hold in the movements. So, um, you know, and this reached a peak, I would say, um, in 2019. And what we found was that we were having to um, really, really push back against Extinction Rebellion and different groups because um, the strategies of nonviolent direct action that we were using um, weren't being respected. The resources were going as well. It's very interesting that um, a, a lot of the resources for XR actually come from people who are involved in the expansion of Heathrow Airport. Um, that's just an important note. And while we need multiple voices and multiple actors, we really went through um, an violence and erasure of the work that we were doing. So at that point, I switched to trying to think about how can we as cultural producers um, work to continue to elevate our boy our voices to resist that um, erasure not just of us in this moment but of these environmental legacies um, that we come with and it's very unfortunate that a lot of people of color have had to enact um, use so much of our energy in the last few years just to stay visible just to re-educate um, climate activists and to try and keep our place within that movement. So um, for me, the way I went about doing that work was um, I worked with the Social Sculpture Lab in Oxford and tried to develop processes of reflection for organizations, for campaigners to try and think about the power and the privilege that they hold. Um, and this was a process that I created where, you know, holding dialogue and conversation, really asking very simple questions about people's relationship to power and how that relationship shifts the design decisions that you make, how it shifts the strategies that you make. And through coming through that process of self-reflection to think about how those design decisions can be different. So a really simple example of that would be um, people's history of relationship with the police and how that um, based on race and class how that might change your um, willingness to be arrested or when you escalate to that tactic. So that's been the way that I've been trying to create um, a self-reflection about the power and the privilege that comes with the design decisions that we make so that we're not necessarily um, you know, blaming each other, we're not reaching that impasse, but we're coming to a self-reflexivity about how we can create that we how we create those cultures and to also even acknowledge that there is a culture inherent within environmental activism that needs to be challenged as well um, so with that work which has become kind of the the heart of the work that i've been doing at the moment um, has been to come into this space of research into reflection to think about what are new ways of activism that we can engage with. Um, so this is um, a research station I created with called ECHO, 
and about recentering our cultures of activism. So rather than um, constantly finding ourselves in resistance to the white supremacy in the movement, how can we be in a generative space where we are thinking about the strategies and the tools that we need? Um, so, you know, leading people on walks with the megaphone, with the listening devices, um, bringing people into intercultural um, interdisciplinary spaces as well. So, you know, we set up a podcast with Echo, which looked at, um, you know, new ways of um, working with international movements around the climate movement and also bringing people into conversation so that people can understand that some of the issues around race um, and white supremacy that they experience in climate activism aren't theirs alone. And also more importantly, or just as importantly, is spaces for allies to listen, to understand what is being asked of them to reshift that culture. So constantly finding those soft spots, those generative spots where we can understand how our design decisions within activism are impacting each other so that we can make new decisions as well. And, and I think this has reached a, a new crux, I would say, um, in the last, last year. Um, you know, when we're thinking again, when in terms of this overarching framing of the climate crisis, when it's thought of as something in the future or something that might happen, that's just not the realities for communities on the front lines of this. Um, and so that's why we also have to think about the climate crisis as being work of critical care, of humanitarian work as well. Last year, um, there was a cyclone, a devastating cyclone, AMFAM, which took place um, in May um, at the sort of, you know, the beginning stages of the pandemic. And this cyclone was one of the largest um, to impact Northern India, Bengal, um, and it didn't even make it onto the radar, not just of the international press, um, but also within the climate movement. And that's because of this framing of this climate crisis as being this future scenario of being parts per million, somewhat abstract, meant that people were disconnected from realizing that this um, cyclone was part of the climate crisis. So those organizations weren't activated. And there is a severe disconnect at the moment between humanitarian organizations and climate campaigners. So we don't have this space in between that is responsive to the climate um, disasters that happen. So I said about working with some young artists who were generating work at the time. And so, you know, these were some of the, you know, devastating, but also awe-inspiring images were coming out of that movement. And we used those to, you know, get fundraisers, get awareness, but it was very, um, it was a very devastating moment for me personally as well, to think about how do we scale up? How do we scale up this responsiveness? And how can the art community um, connect this broken telephone that we have between the front lines? And how can we bring our skills and resources to this moment and reframe the climate crisis as also a humanitarian crisis? Um, and so as we think about that and we think about the next generation, I often think about the next generation of activists. Um, and I've had to sadly, um, give up so much of my energy, mental health, to resisting the white supremacy within the movement itself. So we really need to think about how for the next generation can we make sure that it's inclusive, that along with Greta, that the other communities, the other youth of color are represented, not only as you know, the diverse faces, but also the strategies, the generational strategies that they bring with us as well. So it's really important that we don't replicate that in the next generation. And I think as cultural producers, as people who program and um, are able to lift up voices, the cultural institutions have a really important role in doing that. Um, and this is another work, as I mentioned, <laughs> having to just stay visible has become a whole job into itself. We don't even get as much time to work on the, the climate strategies themselves. So this is another way that I worked with um, a group in London and they were doing these billboards. Davina um, was working on this. It was called Arrivals and Departures. 
So they had these beautiful billboards and people could submit the names of people who have arrived on the earth, the date and when they've left. So I did a takeover of that um, to, to share some of the names of some of the environmental justice um, people that have, have taught me. And I tried to make sure that it was um, inter, intergenerational as well. You know, a lot of the times people who are visible in the climate movement um, are those who have the bigger Instagram followings. And, you know, some of my teachers like Tom Goldtooth on here doesn't even have Instagram, but he's been leading this movement as well. So also thinking that how do we both embrace the digital age, but how do we make sure that it's intergenerational and that we're not losing um, that, that knowledge and wisdom as well. So I think I'm just coming close to the end here, but I just wanted to sort of take us into this next moment that we're in. Um, and I'm really inspired by this image here, which is actually um, a crypto coin, which was created by artist MIA. Um, and she created this cryptocurrency, um, crypto coin as a way to generate funds for a um, humanitarian disaster that was taking place in St. Vincent because of a volcano eruption. Um, and I think it's a really interesting place for us to leave off in terms of thinking about we're in this moment where we have really reached a mass awareness of the climate crisis. I think, you know, the, we, the need for illustration, we kind of moved past that. Um, you know, those people who are going to believe it are with us. If they're not going to believe it at this stage, I don't think they will. Um, and I think it's really important now that we shift into a new moment, that those of us who understand the climate crisis, who understand the gravity of it, that we start to move into spaces of thinking about the strategies, the cultures, the collaborations, the resource allocation that we need moving into the future. And also, what does this work look like? Um, you know, as well as challenging um, governments uh, as we move forward into the COP, coming up with international agreements, all of those things and geoengineering, unproven technologies like carbon capture and storage, all of those things need to be questioned. And for me, that's where the arts and the critical reflection on the cultures of activism has been crucial. We need safe spaces to be able to reflect on the strategies that are moving forward. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough um, the, the lack of diversity, the lack of leadership um, of communities of color within the climate movement. And that is why I've been more effective and, and been able to do my work within the um, art space. And it's really, really um, crucial. So for instance, with at the, you know, whoever holds the money holds the strategies. And so when we're in this moment now where we need to decolonize the climate movement, and that means, as I said, not just listening to those on the front lines of the crisis, but also having spaces where the strategies that we hold both generationally and because of the empathetic relationship that we have to the front line and the relationships that we hold to the nature that we can both develop the kinds of communications that we need to break that broken telephone in moments of crisis, in moments of education, but also that we can start envisioning some of these new technologies and new ways of responding to the climate crisis. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, that was really inspiring. Um, I would like to start the Q&A with one question. Um, so as I myself work in the cultural sector, I would be curious to know what are, in your opinion, concrete key, key ways in which we can meaningfully engage with those who are on the front lines of the climate crisis. Crime, climate crisis, sorry. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the first ways is, is through events like this through centering the voices of uh, black and brown and indigenous cultural producers. And sometimes it's not always obvious. We're not necessarily always artists in the regular sense. We, we create organizations, we create movements, we're architects of movements. So giving space to tell our movement stories is really important, as I mentioned, that, that movement archiving and so that we can understand the histories. The other part would be to think about 
um, not also just bringing folks in to be speakers, but um, allowing us to curate programs. Um, that would bring huge amounts of um, resources into movements as well and capacity building as well. The other ways is residencies. Um, as I mentioned to you, I'm a, I'm a researcher and often the capacity to reflect on your practice, to reflect on what's happened, the strategies that you're doing and convening um, can, can mean the longevity of that movement. So how can you resource um, sort of uh, residencies and spaces as well? So all of the ways that we're programming around climate change to make sure that those resources are going to the people who've been holding that work at the beginning as well. And then the last thing I would say would be the point around having the conversations about questioning the strategies that are being used for climate change and that allyship that we need, um, because that isn't necessarily happening in the climate movement. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience in the auditorium? No, okay, so I'm just gonna read a couple of questions from um, the live stream. Uh, first question, uh, what do you imagine as the key shifts taking place to the culture of activism as we move through the pandemic? Mm. Yeah, I think one of the parts of that has been rethinking direct action and how we can take that. Um, and in some places it's decreased, but in other places increased. And I think a really important part of that is we think about the farmers' protests in India um, and there, the, the protests haven't stopped through the coronavirus. So thinking about how do we support people with the increased need for masks, for vaccinations, for those who are on their front lines, and thinking about the difference between a protest, which is something that's orchestrated, and a movement. So often when communities are responding to oil spills on their territory or increased pollution on their territory and they don't have a choice if to protest or not, it's really important that we provide the support for that. Um, I think we've also seen an increase in digital communications like this. Absolutely. Yeah. So there's, you know, this amazing potential for us to be in conversation with each other, to reflect on what we're doing and also to learn from some of the uh, mutual aid models that have emerged. How can we bring those mutual aid models, those relationship buildings into the future of the climate work as well? Thank you. Um, another question from the live stream. Um, sorry, one second. Yes, okay, so what are your short-term future plans? What is your next battle? Mm, okay. Um, well, I'm teaching um, a module on ecology futures. So I think it's really important to continue to have this spa safe space where as um, cultural producers, we can unpack the power and privilege that we hold in our design decisions and be able to change them. So that's part of tutoring and that ongoing practice. Um, I'm also supporting the development of a podcast which is going to be a um, international podcast that looks at, you know, black and brown scholars who are responding to the crisis. So I find that really fun. And the other part is I'm working with a playwright in London who's writing a play about the, the experience of being a black man in the climate movement and all of the difficulties that come with that and navigating your diaspora community. So I'm helping to develop the, um, online component of that because people won't be able to go to the theater they'll be watching it online and then we'll be having discussions and um, campaign building around that exciting um so if there's no more questions i would like to uh, end the q a with the last personal question so as we already like previously discussed in our preparatory zoom meetings it was very important for for me for us to launch this program with the point of view of a young of the younger generations uh, to value the importance of intergenerational knowledge and for the same reason i would like to close the lecture asking you what advice you would give concretely to young super young activists who may be completely daunted by the problems that we are facing and um, the work it would take to fix the problems we're encountering. 
Yeah, I think the one thing would be to connect with your environmental justice ancestors, um, you know, as a way to counter sometimes the violence that we experience of white supremacy in those spaces, trying to think about how within your own culture, within your own legacy that you have have that ancestral knowledge of connecting to that. Also trying to take time to take nourishment from nature as well, if that's possible. I know that's not always possible for me. I, I know that that's how I keep that energy up and also finding ways to connect to those um, elders who are still alive. And I know that's difficult right now, but you know, making time for that conversation, learning about those histories as well. Um, and then also being okay with the, the grief. I think giving yourself that time for that grief, especially in the pandemic and um, working together and also, you know, leaving your ego at the door a little bit <laughs> and, and not feeling like you have to do it all, that you're in an ecosystem of um, communities and relationships to do this work. Great. Thank you. Um, so I would just like to remind everyone that the next episode of Radio Disaster will be will take place on the 9th of June. Uh, we will have curator and researcher Chus Martinez, who will discuss about the marine ecosystem and the dramatic decline of um, the water systems. If um, the screening, the lecture will be followed by the screening of the movie Sea Lovers, a film by German artist Ingo Niermann. And for more info on the program and to book your seats, uh, please check Modam's website. And I would like to thank Suzanne. It was great and wonderful to have you here with us. And I wish everyone a wonderful afternoon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks.